Uh, before we play anything else, I want to introduce these great musicians. We have George Colligan on the keyboards. <laughs> and my best buddy and favorite drummer from Portland, Oregon, Reinhardt Meltz. <laughs> and most of you probably know this guy. He's local. Tom Guarn on the guitar. Yeah. Yeah, play a couple more tunes and then we'll open it up a little bit.
I thought I might open it up right off the bat and see if anybody wanted to talk about anything specific with me or anybody. Can you really quick, uh, for everyone that's listening online, watching online, we want to be able to hear your questions. If you have any questions, just you know, signal. I'm just going to hand the mic down the, down the row. And, uh, so good job. Yeah. Good call. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, with the six-string bass, what other strings do we have other than the traditional four-string bass? Um, the middle four, I'll try and speak into this so it gets on the stream and everything too. Um, the middle four are just like a standard bass, E, A, D, G, C, and then it's extended a fourth in each direction. So I have a low B and a high C. So, yeah, they're symmetrical, not like those guitars. That's a Scholl catacomb, right? Yes. Um, it's thicker than a regular solid body, right? Yeah, it's quite a bit thicker. It's got a lot of chambered um, compartments uh, pretty much wherever he could. This is the first catacomb he ever tried to make. We kind of had the idea at the same time, and uh, and he just went for it, and I completely fell in love with this thing. And I play it passively. I actually took the battery out of the compartment, so my active passive switch is really just a mute switch now. So my question actually is, is it more about the weight or the air, the airiness, or a little of both? And did it take uh, some getting used to the different body thickness? Uh, it didn't take me... Uh, and much getting used to it is a li it's it's a little heavier than my other Schold six string. Um, it was first a a tone thing. I I told him that um I was wanting my basses to have more sustain and to sound more like wood, especially on the C string. C strings have always sounded brittle in comparison with the other strings. So I was looking for more of an even sound across the register of the instrument and. Uh, I asked him if he thought a hollow body thing might be helpful, and he had just been thinking the same thing, and it worked. I love this thing. So, and it gets a pretty, you can get a lot of different sounds on it. I mean, I can get, you know, a decent little walking sound or a thumb. Or, I know, I like the two separate volume knobs instead of the pickup pan. I feel like I have more control over the sound. That's just the back pickup. I tend, I tend to use mostly the front pickup with about 80% of the back pickup, which is kind of reversed from most guys, like the Jocko setting. With yeah. Any other questions? Lots of questions. On the last tune after the Tom finished up the guitar solo, you played some descending run on the bass. I don't know if you like hands on the double. Oh, the, my, 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 my hiddly. All of us was like, whoa, what was that? My hiddly, hiddly, hiddly. Yeah, on that down run. Yeah. Thing. Can you do that again for us? Because you sure. had the sheet music in a way, and he finished the solo, and you just went. It stood yeah, out the, the the technique, it's a, it's a, it's just a, it's a Victor Wooten slap thing, but finger style. I could never slap to save my life, so I just worked on all that stuff finger style. But it's just an open hammer pluck, pluck. <laughs> 
But the what I did there, normally I would do a 16th note. But I, I kind of got... <laughs> I, it's a muscle memory thing. It's one of those yeah, things. Was, you you, you was watch like, movies. I used to sit there watching movies, and I would just do this for hours, and eventually it got fast. Um, but what I did there was I was playing eighth note triplets. So doing a four-stroke pattern, but in groups of threes. So it, it gets a kind of a weeble wobble. It was it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, sir? Good. Um... I would like you to please briefly describe your background as a musician, either self-taught or schooled or not, and how does that affect your comp your compositions and your approach to music nowadays? Did you decide to throw it all, the, all out the window and start anew, or does your background have an impact on what you do today? Um, well, I started off as a heavy metal drummer. <laughs> Slayer cover band and everything. Um, and I, I was going to Berkeley. I started going to Berkeley as a drummer. Um, and really, I, I was just, I felt out of place. Metal drummer in a jazz school. Um, plus, I was lazy. I didn't feel like carting my drums to the practice room every day to practice. And I realized I wasn't doing the work and I was wasting my time. Um, I'd always played bass. My grandfather used to make me practice bass as a kid, just learning scales. He'd bring music minus one, um, sheet music and recordings home had me Eddie Gomez solo transcriptions. So he had me working on the reading and the chops and the scales, but I never, it was what he made me do. I never played bass with other people. So when I switched my major to bass at Berkeley, I was totally lost. I didn't know blues changes. I didn't know how to improvise at all. I could read pretty much any notation you stuck in front of me. But as far as just making up a bass line, I had no idea where to start. And as a result, I wound up being pretty confused in school. Almost quit playing music altogether. I just thought I obviously must not have what it takes. Um, because I wasn't qualified to do anything else, I just decided, all right, I'm going to buckle down and figure this thing out. And after school, I started taking every gig I could get my hands on, regardless of whether or not I was going to get my butt kicked. And you know, usually if I had a great piano player on the gig, you know, at this point, I'd say, can I grab a few lessons with you, you know, later in the week and just pick their brains about stuff. Guitar players, usually anybody but bass players. Um, I just figured go to the source for the harmony. Guitar players and piano players know it best. Um, so eventually I slowly figured a lot of stuff out. There's still a lot of stuff I didn't know, but I just always tried. The most I figured the most important thing I could do was work on my ears. So I always try to listen to myself um, as I'm playing in a group setting, as if I was in the audience listening to the full band. And maybe, you know, have a little bit of fun, throw a few extra licks in there, but not get too self-indulgent with it. Really try and play to the music and interact with the musicians and just be a bass player. And, uh, yeah, I got a little off track from the, the source of that question. but Yeah, I don't know how, how my background informs what I'm doing. All this music I had never written anything in my life um this is maybe 2007 or 8 and i so i just set the challenge for myself i was like you got to write some stuff the best way to force myself to write some stuff was to book a recording session and you know commit to paying some guys to play music so the so to speak album and then this new the newer one with insight is all the music that i kind of came up with over a few years doing that and i just i just wing it i was like I don't know what I'm doing, but it doesn't matter. You know, I just come up with a groove and keep dorking with melodies until it stops sounding like a solo and more like a melody. <coughs> Some of them still sound like, you know, solo, like strung together. What are you going to do? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I decided at one point that I was never going to let, I was a fear-based player for a long time. I was afraid to not sound good, afraid to, I never wrote anything because I was afraid it would be stupid. So I just didn't do it at all. And I just finally decided, if you want to do anything, you got to step out of your comfort zone. And I just stopped letting myself be scared of anything and just forge ahead and see what happens. Okay. Thank you. If 
feel free to keep the di- I like the dialogue instead of a monologue thing. So that's Damien, I've always been fascinated by the Latin side of your playing. Was that anything from any family roots, or you just like that style of music? How did the Latin aspect uh, come so in? I met this guy. Um, when I moved to Portland 11 years ago, um, it was... I played. I had. A, I played with somebody, and they're like, "Oh man, you got to meet this dude Reinhardt. You guys are gonna love each other." And I met him, and he 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 turned me on to all kinds of odd time stuff and Latin music and everything. I still don't understand it, but it's so much fun to play. <laughs> you know, I just try and not get in anybody's way, and you know, we'll still we'll still be listening to a track, and I'll look at it, and I'll be like, "Is this clave?" And I'll start tapping, and they're like, "No, man, it's here." <laughs> but it's just I have it, to me the. A lot of Latin music is kind of the best of all worlds. It's like great rhythm pocket playing. I mean, super funky, really, a lot of that rhythmic stuff. But then with jazz harmony and more interesting stuff, you know. So, yeah, so I just keep winging it. There's somebody had a hand up back here, so maybe. Do you feel that uh, so you're f- you you moved from Portland eleven years ago? You said moved to Portland. Sorry. Yeah. So do you, do you feel like New York is sort of a different style of was it was there an adjustment period kind of in New York of playing with different musicians? Well, I'd never lived in New York. Are you are you cr- okay? I kind of I grew up in South Jersey, like Atlantic uh. City area. Um, I lived a lot of places though. So Oregon is my thirteenth state. I finally did the math not too long ago. Um, so not much of an adjustment period. I've always kind of bounced around. There is a difference, with I, in my mind, between West Coast and East Coast jazz. I've always felt like the East Coast guys are really interested in breaking new ground, and not they don't want to do the stuff that's been done, you know, for years and years and years, been beating the ground. Um, they want to come up with some new stuff, whereas the West Coast is a little safer and goes well with the pasta. <laughs> Not, I don't mean that as like a total blanket statement, but it's a little safer out in the in the West Coast. Which was Portland was a great place for me. I had never really played jazz at all until I moved to Portland. A um, couple of gigs here and there, just for the pain and punishment of it. Um, but it felt kind of safe. Like it was a lot of restaurant gigs. Most people weren't listening, and I could just I could just like you know figure my stuff out and try things and then realize something didn't work and go home and figure out why it didn't work or yeah i used to make notes after gigs of all the things that screwed me up like you know i ran into an alt chord and then write what the hell is an alt chord (laughs) you know and go home and like figure it out Uh, yeah do you do you feel like because i i just think it's interesting i I, i'm a music musician i'm in a band with my brother and we're actually thinking about moving out to portland Uh, I, i I just heard, do you think it maybe the laid back sort of mentality has helped the fluidity of your bass playing? It, well, I was always scared because I grew up in Jersey and I grew up watching New York musicians who were just like completely like whole other level than I ever thought I would even be able to see. Um, so I was always scared to just like move to New York. I also knew I, I knew the city well enough to know I didn't want to be broke here. So, um, but like, yeah, so like, f- at least for me, it, w- it felt safer there. It felt like a safer place to explore stuff. I wasn't afraid to sound average or mediocre until I could work some stuff out. But, I mean, I'm, I'm making it sound, there's a lot of great musicians in Portland. When I first moved there, my uncle told me, he's like, oh man, you're going to love it. It's like a retirement community for great jazz musicians. <laughs> And it's true. There's some really heavy players out there. So it was a great place to, like, you know, be the low guy on the totem pole, but also in a not quite as an aggressive scene, you know, where I could feel comfortable with guys that were better than me and not feel like I was, you know, holding them back or something. Musically or life in life experience wise, is there anything that has drastically influenced your like creativity or your uh, direction or um, 
any inspiring moments that kind of come to mind that like you thought were pretty cool that you want to share? Um, Really, the biggest light bulb moment I ever had, and the most important thing that ever happened to me musically, was that uh, I was talking about not letting fear guide you. I was uh, doing a restaurant gig. You weren't on it. It was Martine and Ramsey and Vic. And uh, man, the first set, it was just standards. First set, I was just, I sucked. You know, like everything I did, I was trying so hard to sound like a jazz guy. And I just, I couldn't make it happen. I just felt completely awkward and I was got really hyper aware of myself and I like, couldn't get out of my head. And I was sitting there on the break nursing a Coke and it occurred to me that I'm sitting in some Italian restaurant in Lake Oswego, Oregon, in front of a bunch of people who are just eating their chicken piccata and like don't really care. And I was like, who gives it, who cares? And it, it was like, it was really like a huge weight went off my shoulders. And the second set, I just decided I was just going to have fun and see what happened. And harmony be damned. You know, I mean, I pay attention to the harmony, but like, don't sweat those fancy chords you're not quite sure what to do with. Just use your ears, try and listen, and see what happens. And it sounded 300% better because I was just having fun and letting the music happen and not trying to control it so much. That was the biggest thing for me. I mean, you obviously, you said you mentioned you played heavy metal drums, and yeah. now obviously you play mainly jazz, which you're amazing at, but do you ever get the urge, or do you play like a, a rock gig or some pop stuff or something different than what you're kind of doing tonight? Or Well, Reinhardt and I tour with a guy named Gino Vanelli, who's kind of a pop okay. pop icon of the 70s and 80s, and is great. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, and I play with a lot of songwriters, stuff like that. That's actually some of my favorite stuff. Jazz is something I worked on because I figured it was the quickest way to get better at music in general. Not necess- I never wanted to be a jazz musician and still don't really consider myself a jazz musician. Um, I just, you know, I keep getting hired to, to play it and it's a challenge and I love it. And so it's, you know, it's cool. It's what I, it's what I do a lot. But uh, the rock thing, I love it on drums, but on bass it never really, like the h- real heavy stuff, I, tr- I, f- I tried playing some metal stuff and I was like, I'm just not feeling it on this instrument. But yeah, he put a Slayer album on. I like air drum for days. <laughs> yeah. uh, great set, all Thanks. the musicians here tonight. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, uh, your uncle, did he influence you in you know, music and your playing and did you play with him? You know. And you mentioned your grandfather also ha- influenced you and in, uh, bass, you know, and that came back and, you know, those were your early influences. Yeah, yeah in a way. I mean, <coughs> see, the thing was when I was a kid, I hated jazz. But my grandfather, you know, us being in Jersey and Peter Erskine, my uncle, lived in New York at the time. So he would drive, my grandfather would drive me up every couple of weekends. We'd go to 7th Avenue South and see... You know, Peter and Jocko and Stern and Bob Mincer, Big Band and Mark Johnson and Abercrombie and all these guys. <clears throat> and I didn't, I never really liked the music. I mean, I wish I could go back now and check out some of those shows. Um, but the thing, the th- I liked the hang. I liked the people. And the, the way Peter inspired me the most, I never played with him until I was in my late 30s. Um, now we have a trio together. But the thing that I got from Peter was just, I watched, used to watch him operate because he's a very um he's he's a a great god i don't know how to put it he's very good at what he does both musically and professionally and he knows he knows what he wants to do he knows what he doesn't want to do and he's able to state it very clearly and efficiently and i would just watch him operate and realize that that's what the top of the game looks like you know like, he knows how to talk to the club owner. He knows how to, you know, just this, deal with other musicians. And maybe somebody gets a little too drunk one night. He knows how to deal with that, and, you know. Um, but I, I kind of got a sense of professionalism from him. Like, he knows how to operate. He shows up early. He's set up. He's ready to go. He's done his homework. You know, he knows everything inside and out. And that's kind of what I got from him. And then now the past handful of years, um, playing with him, 
has been a whole other thing because now I'm, he, he brought the art of reduction into my playing. Um, not so much this kind of a thing because this is pretty fu- you know, fusy. Um, it's just a do what, do what you want to do type of music. But playing playing his music and Varden of Sepian, the pianist in that trio, it really makes me consider everything I'm doing and why I'm doing it. You know, does this really need, do I need to do this lick or can it, would a whole note just work perfectly? And usually the whole note works beautifully. So, yeah. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. My pleasure. Hey, well, how do you manage writing for No Trouble and being on the road with being a musician with your band? Is that a lot? How about a laptop? Oh, <laughs> laptop. <laughs> um, yeah, then um, it can be a lot. Like I know, like I got, I have till Wednesday to get at least one article to those guys. Um, and it's always in the back of my mind, but I know I'm going to do that at the hotel tomorrow night after the gig. Like, I always kind of plan that stuff out, or on the plane. I write a lot of r- articles on the plane. But I'm not on the road all that much. Not like some guys. I mean, I'm, go- I'm on the road maybe like 100, 120 days a year. That's all. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> another, qu- another question. What's your inspiration for writing these books? Is it that you want to give back to other bass players? Well, honestly, um, initially, the very first draft of anything I ever wrote, um, it was right after I did the Gospel Chops video, uh, the Bass Shed Sessions, Volume 1. And um, I started getting a lot of emails from gospel bass players about how you do this, how do you do that, how do you, um, especially chords and stuff like that. And I found myself writing a lot of the same responses. And I was like, well, I should just put together like a little pamphlet, and that'd be cool for my students, too. And I was on the road. I was sitting in a van every day with Tony Furtado. And, uh, and I just started trying to compile the things that I knew. And then, I mean, I was still, there's still a lot I don't know. So I kept kind of updating the book every time I'd figure something new out or just, you know, learn to realize, like, ah, that's not really the best way I could have put it. Now I understand it better. So I'd rewrite it. And that right hand drive just kind of kept getting thicker and thicker. And then uh, eventually, I was uh, I was about to update it, the whole harmony section. I just decided to write a whole new book about that because I realized it was just going to start to turn into a whole thing. Um, but really, yeah, it was it was the fact that I was getting asked enough that it made it made sense to write some stuff down. But then I started getting a lot of positive responses, and people seemed to like it and say they helped it helped them in some way. Maybe c- because I wasn't coming from a typical jazz text harmony kind of route. Um, just explaining things how I knew them in normal language. And yeah, it, people dug it, so I was like, cool, man. Let's keep put trying to make it better and put it out there. Yeah. Oh, I think. Hi, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you for doing this. It's awesome. Thanks. Um, my question relates to technique. I see you have a, a nice big ramp over there um, with not a heck of a lot of clearance between the strings and the ramp. I'm just curious how you control your dynamics and articulation and such, and also if you can talk a little bit about uh, muting. Yeah. Um, well, I'll start with the muting thing. Um, years ago, I had my one of my first six-string basses. I loved the the range and the possibilities to the instrument, but the C string sounded like crap. It drove me nuts. It was really thin and brittle. And so the muting just came because I just needed it to sound different. So I started trying to palm mute a little bit and um, realized it was kind of a cool sound. Got into that. It's like, all right, cool. And then I got annoyed with how limited my technique was while I was doing it. And the guy I mentioned that we used to tour with, Tony Furtado, was a banjo player. So I used to pick his brain about three-finger rolls and banjo exercises and try and build up my finger independence. For a long time, I just played with just my index and my thumb because I figured my thumb had some catching up to do. So I would just play with these two fingers, and then I would just play with these two fingers just to build my thumb up and then practice different patterns. And the way that all came about and how I work on dynamics is because I, I was I've always thought rhythmically, 
probably because I was mainly, I considered myself a drummer for most of my young life. So when thinking about how to um, practice technique or practice anything, I would just always think of rhythmic ideas first. So I started getting, um, I started laying things out more clearly and coming up with a little bit of a, a system for myself. Um, so I would focus, I figured, all right, here, I'll, I'll get into like my big overarching theory when I was in my self-development phase. I figured there's three things I really need to work on if I want to be a good musician. Um, I need to, I use the word master, but it's like, you know, as close as you can get type of thing. Um, I need to master my instrument so it's no longer an obstacle. So I can, I know every note on the fretboard. I can navigate it well. My chops are there. I can play. I always wanted to be able to play faster than I needed to, just so it didn't, wasn't an issue. <coughs> and then harmony. I need to understand what the chords are telling me, you know, what notes are available to me. And then, sorry, I'll keep trying to talk in this thing. And then rhythm. It seemed to me like that, in broad strokes, was kind of everything. So I started focusing, I started practicing like a drummer. I focused on all of my subdivisions. You know, if I have a 16th note, I would practice playing all the subdivisions. And triplets. trying to internalize all of those subdivisions as strongly as I had the downbeats internalized. Um, and I realized uh, you start applying all these rhythmic exercises to harmonic exercises and you come up with some pretty cool stuff. So my whole thing kind of became a laundry list of rhythmic exercises applied to every harmonic exercise I could think of, playing through changes and all inversions applying, you know, playing just the second and fourth, 16th note of every beat. And then I'd start to switch them up. Be like, I'm going to change inversions every four bars and then change rhythmic subdivisions every four bars. So I'd play downbeats, root position arpeggios for four bars, second 16th notes and first inversion arpeggios for four bars. And I would just keep going and like trying to cycle through every variation I could come up with. And then doing the same thing with full chord scales. And so I used to be really good at that stuff. I don't <laughs> I haven't done it in a while. Th does that kind of? Uh, well, yeah. Dynamics. I did the same thing with dynamics. Um, practicing, emphasizing different uh, subdivisions. And just, you know, practice. I would just, and if I couldn't think of anything to do, I would just write out you know, 16 or 12 or however many beats on a page and start randomly erasing a few and putting accents over a few and just seeing what I would come up with. You know, I just like trying, I'm always trying to think of what I haven't thought of. Okay. It's kind of my thing. <coughs> and then, oh, should I do that 12 beat flow? I wonder yeah. if I can explain it. Um, in Bass Guitar Magazine UK, it was a great, one of the contributors to that magazine, um, a guy named Frank O'Shea. He's an incredible bass player. And I read this one article, and it completely flipped me out and gave me all kinds of new ideas. Um, do we have that whiteboard? It's okay. Don't worry about it. I'll try and explain it. Um, so chromatic scale has 12 notes. It covers every note in the Western scale. If we assign a rhythmic value to every note in the chromatic scale, Say, um, we'll do 12, 12 beats, 12 notes. So I'll do eighth note triplets. It gives us, in 4-4, four four gives us 12 beats. Now, if we pick a scale, I did that in C, so I'll pick C major scale. If I only play the rhythms associated with the notes in the scale and turn all the other notes into rests, it gives every scale a different rhythm. So C major scale on eighth note triplets becomes sounds like a like a bell pattern actually yeah six eight clave yeah you speed it up um, 
And so I started playing with all the different, the rhythms of all the different modes and trying to play through them just to get my brain working in a way I hadn't thought to use it before. Just think of something new. Yeah. Let me see if I can play all the modes like that. Inside Out, one tunes off my first album was me playing with all the 16th note subdivisions. So I was practicing playing first the downbeats, the second 16th, third, and fourth. So. That's in seven, by the way, right? Is it? Dun, dun, oh, the tune is in seven, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this just gave me a little foundation, a little something to play off of. And, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, Mike. So you kind of mentioned that your C string, I uh, saw your low B. I mean, um, always kind of sounded terrible. Oh, um, my C string. Oh, did you say? Oh, for, I thought you said your B for some reason. Never mind. Uh, okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> what were you? I'm curious. I'm curious. Oops, sorry. I mean, I've kind of found that some some bases that I've played with the low B. Uh, well, I one I find trouble like finding a place for the lower notes. Um, but also, um, I just kind of feel like it sounds like farts. Yeah. Um, and getting past <laughs> that, like, I just I haven't really found a place for it. And that's obviously, I know I've a lot of people f have a place for it. Just yeah. Um, I mean, in some music, there is not much of a place for it. It kind of depends on what you're playing. But I've always, yeah, I found a lot of basses. Um, the B strings are too big. And, and obviously, the C strings are too small. Uh, which is why usually when I, when I get my strings from D'Addario, I get with the four string nickel set I like, and then I get the smallest B string I can find and the, the biggest C string I can find just to try and compensate a little bit. I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but that's just what I've been doing. Um, yeah, I try and be cautious about getting overly deep and dark on the B string, um, especially on ballads, I feel like it can really take up too much space. Um, if you just hit a big low C and just let it, you know, you really just kind of, like, I think it sounds cool, but you're just, like, really kind of filling everything up for everybody else. And you want to leave some harm, some, some uh, frequency space for everybody else. But otherwise, I would just live down there. I love that. Hey, one of the people watching the stream live would like to know how well I hope I get this question right. How well do you need to be able to read to work through your book Right Hand Drive? Um, yeah, there's um, there's no tab in either of the books. So just because when I grew up, I didn't have tab, and it forced me to learn how to read. You need, you're going to need to be able to read a little bit, but it starts off pretty basic, so you can work out the notes. The first three quarters of the book is mostly rhythm. Um, and there's a lot of written rhythmic information, um, but it starts it starts off basic. It accelerates fairly quickly, but it's yeah you're gonna need to know. It's like it's almost like reading a, a snare drum rudiment book or something, but then applied to harmonic concepts as well. So a little bit. Hi, Damien. <laughs> All right, so when you play chords, 
how do you go about selecting which uh, chord tones to play? For example, uh, like I play a little keyboard, so when I, you know, keyboard's a different instrument than, than a bass, but you have much more options on the piano than on the bass, so how do you go about selecting chord tones in? Well, and the function of the two instruments is pretty different too. I mean, usually, when I first started out with trying to play chords on bass, um, I tried to, much like everything else, think of every variation. So I used the arpeggios and all their inversions as my guide. So initially, I focused on the root, third, and the seventh, because I figured that's the meat and potatoes of the chord quality. The fifth is pretty static, unless it's altered somehow, and then I would probably intentionally use that, because that's going to be a part of that sound. If it's a minor seven flat five, that flat five is a big part of it. So I started just by finding a basic shape, say on a six string bass, if I played one, three, seven, yeah, right, that's a cool major seven shape. And then I would try and find a four string spanned version of it. So I'd take the middle note, put it up an octave and get that. Put the middle up an octave again, you get a five string shape. So I started with root position chords, and I really just practiced playing through changes, um, getting comfortable with all possible spans of those root position chords. And then I started doing all the inversions. I started trying to put the third in the bass, the fifth in the bass, the seventh in the bass. And really, the only thing that informs my voicing is um, playability. I mean, stuff is just easier to pretty much play any voicing you want on a piano with two hands. Um, it gets trickier on on the fretboard. So if I'm playing a, uh, yeah, say like an E minor 7 flat 5, but I want to put, you know, let's say it's with the fifth and the bass. It's just a lot easier to play a B flat, G, and a D and ignore the root because it's just, it lays under the hand more nicely. And as a bass player, if you're playing that kind of stuff anyway, it's not like you're doing your job. So, like, not having the root in there is not that big a deal. Like, you're obviously got something else going or you're trying to do something else and just create some color. I'm not performing the role of a bass player right there anyway. So, and rootless chords are kind of cool. The main reason I worked on chords wasn't because I thought, yeah, if I want to be a great bass player, i got to be able to play chords all over the place. It was mainly because it got me thinking about more than one note at a time, and um, it got me thinking about the, the connection between the notes and the connections of chords from one to the other. Um, just, you know, just a basic 2-5, um, I'm thinking way more than just my typical root motion, just. But I'm actually, and I would start to use those shapes as the foundation for some kind of improvisation. Like I might just. You know, I'll just try and come up with, just use my chord shapes to guide me a little bit and it just it just helped me see the changes more clearly one of my favorite exercises um, is to play through to voice lead, try and voice lead through changes um, I, mean, I don't know any standard I'm trying to pull this up that's how you know I'm not a real jazz guy I don't know <laughs> any standards Actually, let's do giant steps because that's notoriously awkward to play. <sighs> all right, so normally giant steps, if we wanted to play chords, we'd be kind of jumping all over the place. which is awkward. If I want uh, the voice leading exercise, this is like, this is a real light bulb, and it was on this tune, a real light bulb moment for me. 
I started just trying to voice lead every note in the chord. So I started with a totally familiar, comfortable B major seven shape, one major seven, major third, and then tried to move as little as possible. You know, moving each voice not at all, but definitely not more than a whole step unless I was just changing position. So I realized, okay, B major moving to a D7. I got B, A sharp, D sharp. My B, I'm a half step away from the seventh of the D7. My A sharp is a half away from the fifth. My D sharp is a half away from the root. So there's my next chord. Next chord is a G major seven. Like that, well there's my third right there. Move this down there, a whole step. So you get this whole thing. You know, I was like, I was like, holy smokes, like it's a giant step. It's all right there. And I, it was the, the moment where I realized, because as a bass player, I treated every chord as a separate entity. Like here's a B major seven, and I'm gonna play. And then here's my D, so I jump to D, and then, and you know, and that's, I spent most of my life playing like that, not knowing how to get away from it. And then all of a sudden with that one exercise, I realized every chord is just a slight variation on the last, and then is a slight variation of what's coming next. Like it's all right there, you just need to practice seeing it. So a lot of times I'll force myself to stick to a couple of strings or a very specific range on the instrument and force myself out of my patterns, my typical, what my hand wants to do, and then just try and play through all kinds of different tunes and just try and see the connections, see the notes, see where I am, look at where I'm going, and see the relationships. Does that make sense? When you first started learning jazz, did you have any favorite musicians or like any particular solos that like kind of blew you away and just made you want to transcribe it like right away? Yeah, well, my first, the first things that really hit me, because um, Peter had always given me a bunch of tapes, like trying to get me to like jazz. He'd be like, come on, man, check this out, you dig it. So I had this little stack of tapes, and there was two albums, <clears throat> uh, Weather Report, 830. It's a live in Japan album that's like, it's still, it's one of my favorites. I think it's one of the best live albums ever made. And uh, John Schofield, Blue Matter. And those were the first two that I was like, ah, that's kind of cool. That doesn't, that doesn't suck. Like, I like that. <laughs> and so, like, that, you know, and then it kind of uh, started informing me. And then, really, it was just through forcing me. I always enjoyed practicing playing over jazz changes because it was so hard for me. And I figured, well, I must be getting better. Like, this is kicking my butt. Um, and then I slowly started to uh, kind of dig some of the stuff I was playing. You know, especially when I got away from the real autumn leaves, ding, ding, a ding, ding, a ding kind of standards and getting, checking out more ECM stuff and Steve Swallow and different kind of, I was like, oh, there's some really kind of cool stuff out there. I just got to find it. But Weather Report and John Schofield were my first two, like, I like jazz. Solos that you just like heard? Or is it a I have to translate it? Well, I mean, a lot of Jocko stuff, but I just, I, um, I could never play. I could never make anything sound right whenever I tried to play Jocko. I just always never felt right. So I've, I decided early on I wasn't going to try and cop the Jocko thing. But his, his slang, his solo on that 830 album, it's called Slang on the album, is totally happening. That and his solo on Port of Entry, um, another album, which is like stupid. I still, you know, I still can't play it. <coughs> but uh, lately, well, actually, Steve Jenkins was just here. He sent me a live recording of him playing with Kuzinski and Kif, or Keef, or I don't know how you say it. And he took a solo on that that completely freaked me out. That was one of the one of the only solos I've actually transcribed in its entirety, just because every note of it was gold. Um, usually when I would transcribe, it wasn't because I'm supposed to transcribe, so now I'm going to pick a solo and, and do it. I spent more time transcribing just little snippets 
like I'd hear Michelle and Deggy Ocello like that. I was like, ah, oh, that's that's the thing I want right now. And so I'd figure out what it was. And then, you know, Schofield will play some kind of hip little thing. But it was always like just a couple of bars, maybe even just like two beats. Like I just want to learn that thing. Yeah, like okay, that's cool. I don't care about the rest. Um, so I was just always listening for those things that would perk my ear and make me think I want to know how to do that, and I would transcribe that. But it was always—it's more than just taking the notes, you know, lifting the notes out of the air and figuring out what they are. It's—it's it's the context. So you always need to look at um, what notes they're playing, but what over what chords they're playing, and how how everything's interacting, and where you know how they're phrasing it in the beat is at the end of a long phrase that's resolving into something. You know, I just like try and look as hard as I could at the context of what was played to figure out why it was so cool. Because usually when you hear something cool and you transcribe it, the notes themselves are nothing special. It's all about where they put them and how they put them. At least for me and a lot of stuff I've transcribed. Except for Steve Swallow. Everything he plays is really cool. Yeah, like Charlie, Christian McBride, Charlie Hayden. Yeah. Any other questions or topics? Back to the chord question. So when you're in a band that a bass player is playing a lot of chords, how does that interaction work with the guitar player? Do you have to kind of coordinate or each kind of do your own thing? Or is it, does it free him up to do different things because you're playing chords? Depends on the player. I mean, usually, like, more than once just now when we were playing, I thought to myself, you're standing in between Tom Guarna and George Colligan. Stop dicking around so much with the chords. <laughs> um, but I was like, there's all these bass players here. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, usually, I mean, it depends on the players and depends on what you're doing. Um, I have a, it's been a while, but I've played in a trio for a while with Marco Georgievic, New York guy, and Jeff Elwood, a, a tenor player on the West Coast. And it's saxophone, drums, and bass. So in that setting, I'm like, all right, I can do whatever I want here. Like, I gotta, it's actually a pretty stressful thing, though, because you're the only chordal instrument. And as soon as you start taking a solo, you're like, kill for a piano player right now um but something like this like I'm, I'm i sometimes i start getting into that stuff and i immediately think you're just you're limiting what these guys can do because you're filling up a space and you're dictating you know you're over dictating what's happening in the moment and when you get guys that can listen and interact and react as well as these guys i, I actually prefer to just try and keep out of their way and let them decide where they want to go and then i'll follow Yes, sir. Uh, that kind of, your statement there just made me think, when you're composing, when you're writing, you know, collectively, the world, oh, God, there's another bass player releasing an album. All it's going to be is a showcase for his technique. My friends and coworkers truly appreciate your albums are not that. They're valid musical cool. statements. And I'm wondering... <laughs> When you're writing and composing, are you thinking, okay, I'm going to write based around this technique, this slick, or do you already have in your mind, like, okay, like, Tom's going to be playing guitar, I got my rhythm section dialed in, and, and you compose for the band? I, well, I mean, I don't have the composition chops to try and uh, do anything. It just kind of happens. Um, but I know I'm always writing to what I like, and what I don't like is... Um, overly bass-centric albums. Like I, I mean, some of them are very cool, and I love, you know, there's some guys that I love listening to that do some great stuff, but it's not actually the music I find myself listening to. Like, uh, you know, I can listen to the track and be like, ah, oh, that's amazing. All right, now I'm going to go throw on this album and then listen to some Slayer. Slayer, yeah, yeah. Um, for me, I mean, and plus... I mean, it's funny because, you know, you go to my YouTube channels and there's, aside from the instructional stuff, there's a lot of bass solos and stuff like that. And I hate taking bass solos. There's only actually one bass solo on this album, and it's kind of because they made me. You know, they're like, you got to take at least one. I was like, I don't want it. Um, I'm most happy playing bass. I love guys. Part of the reason is because I love great bass solos so much, and I don't feel like I... It's uh, it's coming out of me, so I figure why why bother let these guys do all that. I just I like playing bass. I'm a rhythm guy, and I'm actually most happy in like funk bands and 
good pop bands and you know, good songwriter bands, you know, stuff like that. Um, the w- I, I very much, I did have a conscious goal with this album, and that was that I wanted, you know, if you erase the name from the front, I didn't want people to be able to tell whose album it was. I just wanted to make good music with great players. And most of what goes into good music is actually the players. That's something Peter told me a long time ago. He's just, just like, write simple and hire great players. I'm like, oh, okay. I don't know if I got the simple part, but I got great players. Um, yeah, I just wanted it to be like the group. This is what this group sounds like. And sometimes I might be a little bit out front, but usually not. And sometimes, you know, let these guys kind of do their thing. Yes, sir. This type of fusion or what, whatever, you know, how much counting are you doing back there? And and and, and, and you're listening, you're listening 100 percent to, I guess, George mainly yeah, tonight. I, I tend to like internalize the the key rhythm of things as opposed to counting. I mean, I know where the pulse is, but uh, yeah, it's more more of like an ostinato rhythm. I'll be, I'll internalize that. You know, that's basically it. Yeah, it is more fun. I, f- I find it to be less uh, academic, and I know I, can't I come from a dancing family, and I like to dance to music and to internalize it, and you know maybe chant the same baseline over and over until I'm interacting with it myself. I know personally, I can't count and play to save my life. Yeah, I force myself to do that though sometimes. Just. Ground, whether it's a sing and a pulse or it's usually not numbers, but yeah, I, I think at least like a pulse, you know, I know where that is. And I can break down what time signature is if I have to. Yeah, I don't like sit there and go one. <laughs> All right. So uh, we've had a lot of great questions, and, and uh, I think it's time for. Uh, the tune. Uh, after this next tune, um, there's going to be Diadario and Aguilar giveaways. So uh, don't rush out because you may have the lucky ticket. Everybody save their ticket stops because then we'd have to take your word for it. Well, she probably would, but <laughs> we don't want to take that chance. All right, Damien Erskine Quartet. Thank you. 
So George Colligan on the piano. Tom Guarner on the guitar. And Reinhard Meltz on the drums. <laughs>